On the 12th of December 1910, Dorothy Arnold, a notable heiress, met a friend on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. She told her that she intended to walk to her parents' home on the Upper East Side through Central Park, but en route, Arnold simply vanished. So who was she and what happened to her? Join me, Briefcase, as we explore this incredible story. Dorothy Harriet Camille Arnold was born in New York City on the 1st of July 1885. Her father was Francis Rose Arnold, a businessman whose family traced its ancestry back to the beginning of European colonisation in North America, with one forebear having allegedly arrived to Plymouth Rock on the Mayflower in 1620. His more immediate ancestors had become embedded in New York high society and business, with Francis himself being a partner in F.R. Arnold & Co., an import company which brought luxury goods into America from abroad. This was an era of unprecedented prosperity in the United States, the so-called Gilded Age, and so the Arnold business, which specialised in perfume, flourished, meaning that Dorothy grew up wealthy and in a family which was known around Manhattan. Dorothy's mother was Mary Martha Arnold. Her maiden name was Samuel, and she hailed from a prominent family whose origins lay in British Canada. She and Francis had three other children, a son, John, who was older than Dorothy, and another son and daughter, Dan and Marjorie, born in the years after Dorothy. To further add to the family's social status, Dorothy's aunt on her father's side, Harriet, was married to Rufus W. Peckham, a noted lawyer who served as an associate justice of the US Supreme Court between 1895 and 1909. All of these connections would ensure that when Dorothy suddenly disappeared many years later, the story attracted significant media attention both in New York and across the country. Dorothy's childhood was along the lines that one would expect of a daughter of a rich businessman in New York at the height of the Gilded Age. The family lived in a large townhouse on the Upper East Side of Manhattan and had a considerable staff there. Growing up, she attended the elite Veltin School for Girls. This had been founded in 1886 by Louise Velton as a school in Manhattan for the daughters of the city's wealthier families, with what was by the standards of the time a very progressive curriculum for a female school. Here the girls learned subjects such as English literature, Greek and Roman classics and French, but she also studied the science subjects like chemistry and physics, after her time in Belton, Dorothy headed for Brian Moore College in Pennsylvania, leaving New York for the first extended period of time in her life. There she focused on studying literature and developed aspirations to become a writer. She graduated in 1905, when she was 20 years old. Following her graduation, she again lived in her parents' house on the Upper East Side and was often seen at high society events in Manhattan yet she retained some ambitions as a writer. After a trip to the family vacation home in the state of Maine in the autumn of 1910, she informed her father that she wanted to get her own apartment in Greenwich Village. This was an area that had already began to acquire a reputation as a centre of bohemianism and literary activity. In the course of 1909 and 1910, she had also composed several stories with titles like Poinsettia Flames, and lotus leaves. Yet sadly for Dorothy, her stories had been constantly rejected by the publishers to whom she had sent them. What was worse, her family mocked her literary ambitions and her father had refused to fund her desire to live in Greenwich Village, informing her that she could just as easily write in the family home as down in Lower Manhattan. These personal setbacks are important for her later story, as we will soon see On a cold morning on the 12th of December 1910, Dorothy decided to travel downtown from the Arnold family home. Her mother had suggested travelling out with her, but Dorothy told her not to and informed her that she was just going down to Fifth Avenue to get an evening dress for a party, which was being held for her younger sister Marjorie in a few days' time. Dorothy was also heading to Brentano's bookstore to pick up some books. On the day in question, 
She was observed to have been well-dressed in an expensive coat of blue serge with fur and a satin bag. These are important points to note as her expensive clothes would have made her stand out on Manhattan's busy streets and could have made her a target for theft. She was also wearing a very noticeable black velvet hat with two blue roses on it. Down on Fifth Avenue and some streets off it, she purchased a number of things, including a box of candy in a store where the sales girl recognised her well enough to charge for sale to the family accounts without even asking her who she was. Outside Brentano's bookshop, Dorothy ran into Gladys King, an acquaintance of the family who was attending Marjorie's party in a few days' time. She handed Dorothy the acceptance notes that she had been intending to post to say that she would attend the party and noted that it would save on postage. This was at around 2pm in the afternoon. Dorothy mentioned to Gladys that she was about to head back home to the Upper East Side and would probably do so by walking through Central Park. With that, they departed from one another. Gladys King would be the last person to ever speak with Dorothy Arnold that we know. After she said goodbye to Gladys, Dorothy was not seen again by anyone who knew her. She failed to show up for dinner at her family home, and her parents and siblings were immediately concerned. It was not like Dorothy to miss dinner, and if she was running late or had decided to go somewhere, she would always send word ahead to excuse her absence. The Arnold family did not immediately contact the authorities. This was understandable. Few people ring the police straight away when a person goes missing, when it's only for a few hours. And yet, they were clearly worried. That evening, phone calls were discreetly made to some of Dorothy's friends to inquire if they had seen her or if she was possibly out visiting them that day. All responded that they hadn't. The Arnolds were anxious at this moment to not let word get out that their daughter had seemingly ran away. This created a situation which led to problems in the weeks that followed. On the night of her disappearance, one of Dorothy's friends that the family had called earlier that evening, named Elsie Henry, had rang the Arnold house at about midnight to see if Dorothy had returned. In response, Dorothy's mother, a woman of a nervous disposition at the best of times, responded that Dorothy had returned home but couldn't speak to Elsie as she had immediately gone to bed with a headache. This incident led to suspicions in the weeks ahead that the Arnolds knew more about Dorothy's disappearance than they were omitting, though it doesn't appear that this was the case. It got worse in the days that followed. Fearing a media frenzy, given their prominence in New York society, the Arnolds decided not to report Dorothy's disappearance. Instead, they continued to make discreet inquiries to try and determine where she might be, as well as hiring a family friend and lawyer named John Keith to undertake some investigations for them. It seems that at this early juncture, the family believed that Dorothy had absconded in retaliation for their lack of support for her literary ambitions. It was only after agents from the Pinkerton Detective Agency were hired and failed to come up with any leads as to where Dorothy might be that they and Keith convinced Dorothy's parents in mid-January, weeks after Dorothy's initial disappearance, to go to the city police and file a formal missing persons report. A press conference was held in Francis Arnold's office in Manhattan on the 25th of January 1911 to announce the disappearance of his daughter over six weeks after she had gone missing. He offered a thousand dollar reward for any information which aided in locating her, a sizable sum equivalent to tens of thousands of dollars in today's money. The predicted media frenzy followed. Much of it focused on a clandestine relationship which Dorothy had been engaged in for some time prior to her disappearance with George Griscom Jr., the son of a wealthy Pennsylvania businessman. Griscom and Dorothy had got to know each other while she had been studying at Brinemore and had remained in frequent contact since. However, he was holidaying in Italy at the time Dorothy disappeared and stated that he had no knowledge of her whereabouts. Meanwhile, the police continued their investigations. One line of inquiry was whether she had been attacked in Central Park while walking through there, as she had told Gladys King she had intended to do when she met her on Fifth Avenue. 
Dorothy's father himself seemed to think that this was the most likely explanation and morbidly speculated that his daughter had been killed there and her body had been thrown into the reservoir in the park. Yet police soon dismissed this theory. They noted that the water level of the reservoir in mid-December 1910, when Dorothy had disappeared, had been too low to conceal her body. If she had died in that way, the mystery deepened when in early February, the Arnolds received a postcard that simply said, I am safe and which was signed Dorothy. The handwriting mirrored their daughters, but a sample of her handwriting had been featured in the New York newspapers as part of the investigation in late January, and it was soon concluded that the postcard was just a cruel joke that had been perpetrated by someone mimicking Dorothy's handwriting. Having dismissed this, the police announced towards the end of February that the investigation was being scaled down Dorothy had been missing for 75 days at the point they made the announcements, and without any evidence of any kind to suggest what might have happened to her, they could only conclude that she was almost certainly dead. There were numerous supposed sightings and reports of contact with Dorothy in the years that followed. These were often based on speculative claims that a woman resembling her had been seen in New York or somewhere else on the East Coast but nothing concrete ever came of these alleged sightings, but they continued to arise. As late as 1935, a quarter of a century after Dorothy disappeared, a tip was given to police about a sighting of her on Fifth Avenue, the last place that she had been seen on the 12th of December 1910. This in itself indicates the manner in which people let their imaginations run away with them when it came to sightings of Dorothy Arnold. After all, she would have been 50 years of age by then and probably looked unrecognisable from the 25-year-old woman who had disappeared back in 1910. Meanwhile, Dorothy's parents continued to search for her and before her father died in 1922, he had spent upwards of a quarter of a million dollars in an effort to find his daughter or discover what had happened to her. There are three major theories concerning Dorothy's disappearance today. One is very speculative. It holds that Dorothy was pregnant at the time, most likely with George Griscom's child, and had undergone a makeshift termination that evening, which went wrong, and during which she died. This seemed to be corroborated in 1916, when a convicted felon in Rhode Island, named Edward Glenaris, made sensational claims about how he had been involved in disposing of the young lady's body back in December 1910. But the information he provided about where she was buried was not confirmed on further investigation and he later retracted his claim. Furthermore, it is highly improbable that Dorothy would have simply planned to stop off somewhere in Manhattan on her way home from Fifth Avenue to have a quick back alley termination before continuing on with her day. The other two scenarios are more likely. Either Dorothy was attacked in Central Park, killed, and her body disposed of in such a way that left no trace, or else, disappointed at her personal circumstances and her stalling literary ambitions, she took her own life. Some of her family members favoured this explanation of her disappearance, as in a letter she wrote to George Grishkam, she alluded to suicide, stating, Well, the short story has come back. McClure's has turned me down. Failure stares me in the face. All I can see ahead is a long road with no turning. Mother will always think an accident has happened. Furthermore, at this point, her relationship with Griscom was going downhill. Both seemed plausible, but with no evidence to substantiate either eventuality. It seems we will never know for sure what happened to the American socialites who disappeared without a trace. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on Dorothy Arnold, I hope you found it interesting and Merry Christmas to all of you. If you enjoyed Briefcase's narration be sure to check out his channel down below in the description and if you have any suggestions also be sure to leave them down below in the comments and I hope you guys have notifications turned on and are subscribed to get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway that's all from me so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.